Hello, and welcome back to MetalDisciple.com's Metalheads Podcast. My name is George. And I'm Buke. And we are back again. It is now the holiday season. It's early December. We're uh, starting to feel a little festive around here. Yeah, you got your Christmas uh, satanic pentagram Christmas sweater on. That's right, man. (laughs) Black. It's got red and green upside down crosses and a baphomet goat pentagram with a santa hat on <laughs> snowflakes <laughs> anything on anything on the bottom uh no, no just no. upside down crosses no. yeah there's just more crosses <laughs> and snowflakes on the back we'll be getting into some more christmas stuff this episode but there's a few items of business we need to take care of first first of all the program that i'm using to though it's like a plug-in to host the podcast unbeknownst to me, uh, had a limit of 20 episodes that it would allow in the feed, which then propagates out to iTunes and the rest of the world. And so when I tried to post the last podcast, it it said it was published, but it wouldn't show up in the feed. And I'm like, huh, what's going on? And I went to unpublish it and I accidentally unpublished the previous episode. And lo and behold, the new one showed up. I quickly surmised that there was a limit of 20 podcasts. (laughs) I wrote to the developer and he came, he actually wrote me back and said, well, I'm working on this. There's going to be a fix. But in the meantime, you could do this, add this to the end of your feed, you are, uh, the feed URL, and that'll take care of the problem. Problem is, for me to do that, I basically have to rebuild the feed, which I will not bore you with the technical details of that. But it's a lot of work and... You know, I'd have to resubmit to iTunes, and I'd have to recreate the feed, and it's just a big pain in the ass. So I'm sort of playing a game of chicken with the developer of what's going to happen first. We run out of room, or he fixes and rolls out a a fix. I had to... this, This is technically episode 19, but because of the two retrospective episodes and the barbecue special episode, we're technically at like 22. Mm -hmm. So I dropped... The two retrospective episodes, I know you're going to be crushed. (laughs) They've been unpublished. They haven't gone anywhere. They're just not published. Once this is resolved, I will put them back. Yeah, and we we just wanted to say this in case you, uh, and and we'll remind you, you know, next episode also, if you've subscribed to the feed, and I know we're around the holiday time, we missed a couple episodes, or sorry, a couple weeks, but if when you normally, you know, go to your podcast player and you pull up episodes if it's not there you know every day or so do another search for metaldisciple.com's metalheads just search for it again uh, hopefully we don't have to navigate to somewhere else yeah. you know, if we have to take the wrap the podcast up and move it we'll give you guys you know enough heads up and we hope you stay with us you know yeah if you're subscribed you might have to resubscribe but like I said, I'm hoping that he gets the fix out before before too much longer. I mean, you know, I can just start unpublishing the early episodes. Yeah, if we need to do like a revolving door of episodes, you know, one goes out, one one goes in. Until, until it gets fixed. It gets fixed. Yeah. That's what we have to do. And if after a couple of months he hasn't gotten it done yet, then we'll just have to move on to something else. But And then, of course, then they'll all be back. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll be missing the George Retrospective episodes (laughs) quite dearly, so it pains me to have to do that to you. (laughs) Um, There's another couple of things about last episode that I wanted to mention. Probably nobody else noticed this, but when I went back and listened to it, when I was talking about Celtic Frost's Morbid Tales, and I was like, 30 years ago, you know, this came out, and this is the beginning of blah, 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 you know, Trypticon and, and Tom Warrior. I was fully aware of the fact that he had a previous band called Hellhammer. I just meant that it was the beginning of Celtic Frost. And in case anybody out there was going, you dumbass, don't you know about Hellhammer? <laughs> now, I know about Hellhammer. I just, I was referring to specifically Celtic Frost, so... In case you were cursing me out about that. And see, to me, that you could have told me anything about them, and they would have gone right over my head. I realize that probably goes over most people's heads, <laughs> but uh, for but, me, I'm a perfectionist. I wanted to clarify that I was, in fact, aware of Hellhammer. There's probably people out there who know, too. and they you Sure, know. sure. Also, I wanted to talk about when we talked about the Testament albums last time. And you jumped on me for a second saying Dave Lombardo was never in. No, 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 no. It's not that. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually went back and listened to Lowe. And I remembered why I really didn't listen to that era in Testament very much. Pretty much everything up until Lowe was a particular way. It was 80s thrash. And 
Low came out in, I think it was like 94 or something like that. And while it's awesome that James Murphy was on the album, because I love James Murphy, I was a little disappointed that they changed their style to try and fit in with the current scene. In 94, death metal was the thing. Yeah, Low was in 94. And while, you know, I can listen to it now and I go, that's a badass album. It wasn't that it was a badass album or that it wasn't a badass album that I didn't really listen to it. It was because I was a little disgusted. (laughs) that they were changing with the time they were trying to fit into something else instead of doing their thing you know because chuck billy started doing a lot more deeper harsher vocals and you know compared to like vocals harsh vocals now is was nothing it was just sort of putting an edge on there and listening to it now i'm like this is fucking awesome but at the time i was just a little put out that i was like you know you're just trying to change with the times that's not real that's why you got to do that you know why you gotta? Why you gotta change what you're doing just to try and fit in with the new crowd? Mm-hmm. But okay, so then when I mentioned last week the gathering, that was my number two or three album. And that was like two we, albums after. Yeah, that, that was that came out in '99, and that mm-hmm. had uh, you know my favorite song DNR on it, right? And I yeah I mentioned Lomb- Lombardo on drums. I'm not saying you had tapped out on Testament, but you were kind of like I was. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you were kind of like yeah. You know, yeah, you're not into the, what they had evolved into at that point, right? What was the one between those? I, I, there, it was like James Murphy album, not James Murphy album, James Murphy album. De- Demonic. Demonic, yeah. It was See, 97. And the, I, it was just, you know, those were heavier albums that I was just like, whatever, you guys changed. I'm just going to listen to the classic albums and, you know, do something else. And so I, it was sort of a lost years for me. And so while I saw them, and I, yeah, I even bought them, I have the CDs. Didn't give them that much attention, mm-hmm. which is obvious since I didn't even know that Dave Lombardo played on The Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> and then from The Gathering to the formations of Damnation, almost nine years went by from 99 to 08. Right, which is why when f- the formation came out, I was like, oh yeah, Testament's back. I wonder what it's like. <laughs> and and I was like, oh, well, this is... <laughs> and then I was happy because they had updated their sound to be more contemporary. But, you know, it took me a while to come around to that. And, you know, I'm not such a... And look at this now, like we said last week, um, or sorry, last episode, Dark Roots of the Earth. It's amazing. Yes. Fresh. In fact, I was just coming back from the gym today, and I stopped at the bank, which is why I delayed us 15 minutes. And as I was wearing my testament, uh, was that a hoodie, sweatshirt? I don't, yeah, know, what you, yeah. I don't know what you got. Hoodie. hoodie. When, did, <laughs> when did the sweatshirts become a hoodie? I don't know. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> they were called sweatshirts in my day. <laughs> Whatever it is, I was wearing my Testament one as I was going into the bank in the pouring rain. And some other guy who was of similarly uh, aged as me, uh, who you wouldn't ever look at and go, metal fan, like stopped me in the pouring rain and was like, dude, I love your sweatshirt. <laughs> He's like, they have a new album coming out. I was like, yeah, next year. Get, leave me alone. I'm getting wet. <laughs> but so, yeah, Testament's still going strong. Yeah, Testament's, they certainly are. Yeah, when we saw them live the, a couple of times the past couple of years, amazing live show now. That totally blew, blew me away, how much energy they have up on stage and how much fun they seem to be having up on stage, too. That's great. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, Alex Skolnick is back in the band. Oh, can I mention something also that I was looking uh, online? We talk about bands, uh, you know, like Testament, finding themselves and coming back again. Mm-hmm. I had mentioned months back how happy I was to see Superjoint Ritual, now playing under the name Superjoint, reform for the Hardcore Horror Fest. Why did they drop the ritual? I don't know. Was it like a licensing, yeah. like, you know, rights kind sure. of thing? I mean, is somebody not in the band that owns the name? I don't. Uh, there was some problems between Phil and the drummer mm-hmm. for a while. I don't know if it was rights and stuff like that. But now is the time of year when festivals for next year are starting to be shored up and yeah. artists are being named for, you know, big open air fests. Super Joints playing open air festivals next year. In Europe? Yes. So there's a chance. <laughs> there's hope. There's hope for my Super Joint ritual yet that they will come back and come back around. Somebody needs to tap Phil on the shoulder <laughs> and be like, hey. Remember all those down EPs you were going to put out? You're supposed to put out four of them, I believe it was. You've put out two of them in the, like the last three years. thought this was going to be like boom, 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 you know, sort of a we're not going to put out an album. We're just going to put out an EP every couple of months, not every couple of years. What's up with that? <laughs> I've said it too. If we do the first Convincing George segment, they're the band that I'm, I'm starting with first. 
It's fair enough. You'll probably you'll, you'll probably get a good result out of that. <laughs> Boy, I love those guys. I I would hope that they this again would turn into a U.S. tour. We get more super joint. Never can tell. All right, so back into this whole Christmas thing. Christmas is just around the corner. I haven't started shopping yet. I am not being a good consumer. I'm being pestered by my family to come up with ideas for things that I want. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't have time. Leave me alone. But I was thinking the other day, heavy metal and Christmas. You know, not everybody that listens to heavy metal is a heathen or a pagan or a devil worshiper or what have you. I understand that. But at the same time, isn't, wouldn't it be a little odd for a like a hardcore true cult black metal fan to be into Christmas? You would think. Be like, yeah, black metal man, down with Christianity. But Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, but Merry Christmas. <laughs> let's hang the stockings and let's put up the uh, nativity scene. Yeah. So I'm like, well, maybe maybe they don't do that. Maybe they, they go like old school and they're like, yeah, man, this is Yule. <laughs> it's like pagan and stuff, you know. So <laughs> Merry Yule, you. <laughs> yeah, but you wonder with how many of these guys, the black metal true uh, how many of them actually practice that <laughs> outside some do. Of, them, out, of course some do yeah, john from dissection he uh he believed that pretty firmly as oh, he I shot himself he yeah i know he did <laughs> uh but you wonder how many of them actually believe it and you know yeah yeah i like i like it all and, and i'm not you know i am not a religious person i do christmas solely as a consumer holiday <laughs> I don't have any deeper meaning behind it than that, but it, it's, I'm not going to go and be like, no, nah, man, it's you. <laughs> it's Christmas, whatever. You know, it's it's a holiday for everybody. It doesn't matter if it's religious or not. It, even if you don't believe in it, I, I, I have no problem admitting I'm Catholic. I was raised it my, my whole life. Um, sometimes the meaning escapes me, you know, and it turns into a cons- consumer thing. Sure. But... I have no problem with people wanting to celebrate another holiday of giving and spending time with family. Sure. I mean, you know, Slayer, one of the biggest, most Mm -hmm. evil bands out there, Tom Araya. Yeah. You know, many times has come out. Yeah, he's he's religious. I I think he might be Catholic as well. He is. He's actually come out and said that, hey, he doesn't believe it. It just makes for a badass subject matter. Exactly. So, you know, whatever. And that'll lead us into, we were, we were, you and I were sitting around talking last week doing prep for this, and we were thinking, hey, for the metalheads in your life, what would be a good gift? Exactly. And so, I don't know about you, but I came up with a list of some ideas. Some of them holiday related. Some of them just kind of cool ideas. Mm-hmm. The first think? one that instantly jumps to mind: mm-hmm. hundred bucks. Go to your local Best Buy. Go on Amazon. Sony. I think you and I both have it. The turntable. The Sony turntable yeah. is a excellent, excellent gift to have. Yes, vinyl is cool. I mean, yes. I it's starting to bug me because vinyl is actually becoming so popular that it's. It's trendy. I hate it's, to say it. Yeah, it is. And and so I kind of cringe every time I start to expound upon my love of vinyl because I know somewhere somebody is going hipster. <laughs> and, well, and also, it's to me, you know, us going to the store. You know, I go to the store just like you a couple of times a week, even if I don't buy anything, just to browse. Mm-hmm. It's starting to seem like it's turning into a, a money grab quickly. Oh yeah, because they're start, they're seeing that people are buying vinyl, and just reissuing just everything, reissuing everything, and hey, let's reissue it again in a box set. Like or, that, I can't believe you bought that Dio record store day thing, and they totally raped you in the ass. I, I know. You're like, ooh, let me pay. What did you pay? Like eighteen dollars? Yeah, eighteen dollars for, for like two tracks, so three tracks from the tribute album and three live tracks. When I paid eighteen, probably for the whole album, right? I paid well. I paid a little more than that, but I got the whole thing, double album, red vinyl, just normal, not record store day. So the, I okay, I did. I'm a gimmick. I fell for the gimmick. Well, I fall for him, Mastodon, too. Mastodon. I got the mother load. The the ten inch or was it ten inch seven inch? No, it's ten. Ten. Yeah. Picture disc, mother load on the front. That's it. Do you have the album? On yes. Vinyl? So what was the point? <laughs> it was a pretty picture disc. Yeah. 18 pretty. bucks. Hey, well, I fall hard too. Like I told you last night over a text message, I, you know, Century Media just uh, reissued like most of the In Flames catalog on vinyl and I ordered six of them. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them I don't even like. <laughs> it was like uh, the soundtrack and uh, 
reroute, I think, were the ones that I was, I've was i never been a fan of, but I was so happy. I just got caught up because I was like, ooh, Clayman, ooh, Horacle, ooh, Jester Race, ooh, Colony. <laughs> yep. I don't want to go off on a quick side note here, but yesterday I went to uh, Soundgarden, which is probably the greatest music store. Um, Squirrel. <laughs> it's, it's probably the greatest music store around in this area yeah, yeah. in this area hands down that's probably one of the best in the nation has to be we should do a tour of the country and find <laughs> out can i tell you guys how much it breaks my heart when i leave their store yesterday with my little bag of records little bag and i oh well, <laughs> with 200 hundred dollar bag of records and i send george a message saying oh yeah i got this and that doom album i got yesterday funeral circle yeah and I'm like, for, I kicked you in the balls and yeah, said, yeah, that's not real good. For George to tell me, I I, I saw that. I passed on it. <laughs> you, oh, it's funny because you just did that to me when I got those A Storm of Light albums. Only I know that they're good. <laughs> yeah, I did. I've seen them for like the past month. I know yep. they're good. <laughs> so. And you know actually what happened? I tried to Spotify them in the store. The mm-hmm. signal was bad. So I'm like, eh. The, the, the album cover is cool. It's got to be good. <laughs> it's not terrible. It just wasn't enough to to hook me to to want to because there was so much other stuff in there if it was like only two or three albums there that i was getting i would have bought it too the album art's cool yeah but given how much you know you drop a couple hundred dollars there easy <laughs> out of doubt so it was just you know it was on the fringe of what was i was like something's got to stay you, you have to stay <laughs> okay the people who like structure and order are going crazy right now back yeah. to the gift guide so a, a turn turntable is a great gift. Maybe to go along with it, a pair of headphones. Yep. I was going to say the headphones that, that Buke and I are using right now are the Motorhead Motorizer headphones. They got the cool Motorhead logo on the side. They're, they're the big over-the-ear headphones. They're, I'm not going to give you a price. You know, they're they're not cheap, but the, as far as headphones go, they're not that expensive either. And personally, I think they sound really great. I've got some other ones that I use for reviewing and stuff that are like in-ear ones that are even more pricey, but... But these are a fairly good priced and a good quality headphone. For, they're they're geared and you know set up for listening to hard rock and heavy metal. So that would be a nice gift to get somebody. Actually, Amazon has them right now for ninety bucks. Nice. Yeah, that's I paid at least thirty forty dollars mm-hmm. more than that. Yep. So I was thinking uh, some magazine subscriptions to heavy metal magazines. We got it. First of all, we got to keep them alive. Yes. Second of all, it's funny that I'm going to actually promote them. The two that I like the most. Uh, Metal Hammer and Terrorizer. I know I was busting on Metal Hammer earlier in the year, but that's that's on a business level. On a content level, I like what Metal Hammer does. I, the two the two British magazines they are just badass. You could also go with Decibel and Revolver. To a point, they're okay, but they they're kind of lame too, in some aspects. <laughs> um, but you know, a magazine keeping abreast of the metal situation. I pour over all four of these magazines every month. That's how I find out about new bands. I'm like, I read the articles, I look at the reviews, I look, and I pour over the the advertisements. You know, because there's just tons of ads in there for you know little labels and stuff. And I'm like, oh, who's this band? Okay, check them out, listen to them. That's that's my obsessive compulsive disorder is trying to find new bands and that's how i do it so another thing i saw that was interesting that i i'm half tempted to get but can't quite justify is the king diamond garden gnome have you seen that yeah, he's awesome that's a little badass dude man <laughs> i'm sure if you google that you can find it it's it's pretty cool <laughs> yeah i was also thinking um i know you know Money situations vary, you know, person to person. If you have, hey, 20 bucks, even $9 you can spare a month. You want to give it for, you know, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, even for a friend. If you don't have the money to go out and buy vinyl records every month, a Spotify subscription makes an excellent gift. Because sure. you and I countless times have on the fly when we're out and about. Even now, you mention a band, eight times out of ten, it's on there. Yeah, yeah. They're pretty good with metal. And, you I got to give them that. Yeah, so it beats going out and trying to illegally download it. Just stream it. It helps the artists get yeah. some revenue from it. Barely. Yeah, barely. <laughs> but but still. Yeah, it's better than better than not doing yeah, anything. You could take the music on the flying with you. So that's a. I thought that was a pretty good gift. Yeah. Uh, another one I've got uh, is a book that I read this year that I thought was pretty cool. It's called Black Metal: Evolution of the Cult. It's a really thorough, really in depth book on black metal. If you're into black metal, it's a really good read. 
Another uh, kind of silly item that I came across was Metallica Monopoly. I'm like, what exactly is that? Is that like, you know, Hetfield Boulevard and, you know, Hammett Street? and <laughs> Would the Black Album like be Boardwalk? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I didn't, I couldn't really see the board to see what was on it, but uh, apparently there's an ACDC version as well. Hmm. And, and even, um, you know, I don't read as much as you, but one of the books that got me actually up to speed on a lot of history is that book, uh, A Sound of the Beast. Yeah. I can't remember who wrote that. Is that Ian, Ian Christie? Isn't yes. It? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent book on history from the early days, you know, Sabbath, Blue Cheer type of stuff all the way up to where we're at when the book was written a couple years back. Yep. I've got that one too. Yeah. Great book. Uh, there was a great, this was a great summer for a year, actually, for documentaries. Yeah. The uh, Lemmy documentary. Yep. I was going to, I, I'm I, sorry. I, no, I, I didn't, I was going to put it on my list, but I forgot to, but that was one yeah. that is a good one too. Get the Lemmy documentary. You may shy away from it. The Alice Cooper documentary was released. Yeah. Anything Sam done is good. You know, there's the evolution, evolution. <laughs> Yeah, is that what it's called? Or metal evolution? Metal evolution, something like that. I, yeah, something like that. It's like a series, and that that was really good. It was didn't come out this year, but you can also get the uh, Flight Six Six Six, the Iron Maiden documentary, and then of course there's the Lamb of God one that just came out as the palace is burned. Don't need to watch that. I haven't watched it yet. You either. and I need to have. You should try to hold out. You and I have a viewing party. Exactly. And we come out here and share our thoughts, which are actually I'll tease it. If you want to watch a documentary, we're going to have an interview with Cam Pipes on the show later. Mm -hmm. If you want to go online, we can include the notes in the podcast notes. Um, Three Inches of Blood earlier this year uh, released a documentary on their touring throughout Canada. Really? I didn't know that. Yep. Well, So that was actually what the basis of the interview was for, to talk about that doc, uh, documentary. It's released online. They were followed around uh, for know, a couple months on this tour as they trekked all throughout Canada. As you may have guessed by my ignorance of the documentary, I was not a part of this interview. Buke ventured out on his own and got this one. So I haven't actually heard it yet either. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. <laughs> what else you got? Um, for It's the Christmas spirit, and who doesn't want some spirits? Obviously, most people by now have probably heard of the Iron Maiden Trooper beer, which I was going to mention this in the news, but did you see that they're going to be releasing them in the U.S. in Tall Boys? Yes. <laughs> in cans? I was like, what? I was like, well, you know, uh, I'm optimistic about this because maybe I can get it in a keg. Hmm. You know, if, if they're going to be... They said bottling something, it more. Bottling and- it more here. Maybe it's possible to get it on tap because I would love to have that on tap. It, it's, you know... It's not the best beer out there, but it's Iron Maiden beer, and it's pretty good beer. I mm-hmm. think it's not it's not the best, but it's certainly no you know Paps Blue Ribbon bullshit. But if you're not a fan of the Iron Maiden beer, did you know that the Pig Destroyer has a Pig Destroyer permanent funeral beer? I did not. I did not know that until last night either. And being that they're a local band, it's got to be available around here somewhere. Maybe Will can find it for us. Yeah, maybe somebody's got to find this. If you know where we can get Pig Destroyer's permanent funeral beer, please drop us a line. For you wine drinkers, Dave Mustaine has a wine. He's he's had a wine for like 30 yep. years. Yep. <laughs> yep. So just saying, hey, maybe if you know for the, those of you with the little more classy palates. Well, I think Motorhead has a wine too, but they also have a vodka and something else. But, you know, it's impossible to find. No, if you it? know where you can find that, I'd love to get a hold of that too. <laughs> Perhaps you're more of a foodie than a drinky. <laughs> um, the Sword have their own brand of hot sauce called Tears of Fire. Hmm. I'd like to try that out as well. That sounds kind of good. I like spicy things. I like hot sauces. You picked up the Guar barbecue sauce? Yes, which I have not cracked yet. I wonder. If, <laughs> I better look at that and see how long it's good for. <laughs> I, I meant to do something. I was waiting to to do some uh, grilling, and I don't think I did any grilling after barbecue this year. Like remember, like remember that fine thing about edible, you know, metal stuff. When I was downtown at our local record shop, I saw that Anthrax Killer Bees. I went in there looking for it after you mentioned that. I didn't see it. You, it was actually jam. I mean, honey made from killer bees. Yeah, and it was old because that came out in like ninety one, yeah. ninety two, something like that. It was maybe even older. Um, so that probably wasn't very tasty no, anymore. Honey, actually, a, str- a fun fact: honey never goes goes bad. Really? Yep. Well, honey's one of the only foods that never goes bad. It'll harden, right? But it'll never go bad. You can heat it up again. Well, I still wouldn't eat it. No, I wouldn't eat it either. But I would have liked to have had that on the <laughs> shelf. Um, 
I also want to say this too. You have turned me on to it. If you're looking where to get a lot of these stuff, these items, and you don't have a local record shop nearby, because uh, you know they are dying, you may have a Best Buy and something like that. And if they are selling vinyl, they're selling a small rack of the popular stuff. Mm-hmm. You've turned me on to Amazon. Oh, yeah. How extensive their vinyl collection is. And, you know, I've got Prime. So a lot of these, I'll be like, oh, okay, well, the new Bloodbath. Okay, well, Amazon has it. Or I can get it from, you know, Soundstage Direct. You can look you look at them side by side, and the prices are the same. Difference is Amazon's going to ship it to me for free. No, the shipping on some of these other... Oh, the shipping is almost half the cost of the, <laughs> the record. Yeah, yeah. And so... uh I've been sort of going towards Amazon for a lot of my like pre-orders and things like that. Unfortunately, they're not real prompt. You know, the Bloodbath came out like last week. Uh, yeah, Bloodbath. And there was a line of Deathless Kings, My Dying Bride, that also was released last week on vinyl. They haven't even shipped yet. They gave me the Bloodbath, I think it was. They gave me, or maybe it was the My Dying Bride. One of them, they gave me a ship date of like end of December. I'm like, Really? And like Exodus, when that one came out, they moved it back. And the Iron Maiden singles, a couple of them, I finally have them all. But, you know, they got held up. I don't know, too much demand, whatever. But so if you don't mind waiting, the price is right. (laughs) Yeah. The only other thing that I had to mention as far as a gift uh, was Christmas songs. The Twisted Sister, A Twisted Christmas album. I grew up a big Twisted Sister fan. I love Dee Snider. They do some pretty rocking versions of Christmas songs on there. There's also another one. I think it's called A Very Metal x or something like that. That's the one where you can get Dio and Iomi doing God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. That is like the best Christmas song ever. So that's what I got for gifts. Yeah. And of course, you know, a shirt always works. You know what I think sucks, though, is how lame it is that you can't order beer online. Because there's so many cool things. Like, what's his name? Adam, from who is uh, in one of those magazines I just bashed. Uh, his Brutal Truth column. Uh, you know... They feature some really cool beers in there. And you're like, well, where can I get it? I don't know. I could, If I could just order it online, that would be hella easy. Mm-hmm. I realize it probably has to do, well, actually, a small reason of it is so kids can't order alcohol. But I think it has a lot to do with licensing and taxes. shipping and taxes yep. and, you know, crossing state lines and bullshit like that. But come on, there's got to be a way. And there's some states where you can ship wine. Yeah. But you can't do beer. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's like when I was in Wyoming, and I had that moose drool. Remember? Do you had some of that when you were yep. out there, weren't uh, you? Yeah, when I was in Yellowstone, I had it. Yeah, and I was like, moose drool. That's pretty cool shit, you know? But uh, you can't get it around here. If I could be like, hey, ship me some moose drool, that would be a good thing, you know? Trooper beer, you know? It's not available everywhere. I'd like to be able to get that. Running Wild has a mead. I'd like to be able to get that. Ghost has their grail. Yes, I haven't been able to find that yet. If I could order it online, that would be helpful. So maybe when Will joins us on the future episode, he can enlighten us. And possibly find us a way around it. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you get beer? <laughs> <laughs> how do we skirt the system? Exactly. So uh, so also keeping in the holiday spirit, too. We uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little cheesy, but George and I were having fun with it. Yeah. We have put together our... <laughs> Holiday naughty or nice list. Yep. <laughs> so uh, you want to go ahead and start out who we have on the list? All right. Well, this one didn't actually happen this year, um, but it sort of bled over into this year. Uh, this is my first naughty. That would be Tim Lambesis. You naughty, naughty boy. Don't try to have people killed. Was He was sentenced this, was he? this year. I didn't. Correct. How long did he get? Nine years, I believe. Nice. Yeah. See ya, sucker. <laughs> so... So definitely naughty for him. And yeah. we like we talked about last episode, Wino. Yep. Also on the naughty list. Naughty. He's kinking off that he's ho- on, meth. He's hoping that Santa won't leave him coal, but he'll leave him a pile of yeah. meth in his stocking this year. Okay, then he could end up like our next naughty, Dave Brocky. Who is deceased. <laughs> while while Dave was a nice guy, he was a little naughty with the heroin and well now he's not with us anymore. And, the fact that he has deprived us of him and deprived himself of all that he could have done with the rest of his time, I think that's naughty. Yeah. On the nice side, you gotta give baby you gotta give baby metal. They're just cute little Japanese girls. Come on. Love them, hate them. They're cute little Japanese girls. Come on. They're nice. <laughs> when I saw that Metal Sucks poll this past week that that was what the readers picked as the album of the year, I let out a scream. Oh, I'm not behind that. No. 
you know, the music's okay for what it is, but it's we not, will never be. They will never be in my ears. You can't take that as a serious thing. I no, mean, come on. But yes, they are nice. You know, fun little girls doing metal. Yeah, it's cool. And while he's not bringing you any presents for Christmas, <laughs> King Diamond gave us a present by coming back and going out on tour this year. And so I'm putting him in the nice list. And he may not like that, but he's on my nice list. <laughs> Also on my naughty list, Phil Rudd from ACDC. He tried, he didn't actually try to lambesis, but I, I read, I think it was yesterday, that he just, the only reason, the only thing he did was make a threat over the phone saying he was going to have somebody killed. I'm like, really? You can arrest people for that? That's fucked up. So, eh, kind of naughty in that he got in trouble anyway. You know, I, on my nice list, and actually, this was before speaking to him and even after talking to him more, Brian Slagle. All right. For the fact that he continues to wave the flag of heavy metal. And take time to talk to nobodies like us. <laughs> yes. But, you know, he continues in his label, Metal Blade, to put out excellent releases, you know, championing in new bands. So he's definitely nice. All right. Well, you know who my final nice on the list is? Tom Araya, Or as I like to call him, Santa Claus. <laughs> Have you seen the latest picture of him? He's got a big, bushy, gray beard. I'm like, dude looks like Santa Claus. <laughs> he does. You, you know, he's the metal Santa Claus. He's bringing metal to all the little good and bad boys and girls. <laughs> <laughs> That's the metal Santa Claus. That's awesome. <laughs> That's all I got for the <laughs> nice. All right. You want to get into some news? Yeah. On a downer note, we, I was just busting on Dave about his wine. But unfortunately, Dave Mustaine's mother-in-law's remains were found roughly half a mile from the campground where she went missing. I assume she died of exposure or probably something, but we're sorry to hear about that. Isn't that tragic when you you always you hear these stories pop up every so often of people with Alzheimer's or dementia? Mm -hmm. And you always hear how tragically close they're found to where they went missing from. Yeah, they were talking about all the people that were out canvassing the woods. Well, half mile isn't that far away they <laughs> no. didn't obviously didn't canvas that far if they couldn't find her it's just tragic because you wonder you know did somebody walk if they're if they're you know you would think going from where she was first missing out make a circle mm -hmm. god you hope nobody maybe walked past her if she was down somewhere in bushes or something or maybe she was confused and she was scared and she heard people and she got scared and she hid so they didn't see her you know yeah. who knows but our condolences to mm -hmm. dave and his family that's not the only bad news in the Megadeth camp this past week. Guitarist Chris Broderick and drummer Sean Drover have both quit Megadeth. Wow. Has not been a week for Dave. I read somewhere that Dave Lombardo reportedly was open to joining the band. I don't expect that'll happen. But wouldn't that be something if he did? And wouldn't it be something if I had no idea that that happened until like 15 years later? <laughs> <laughs> have you heard online, too, what the lineup may be that people would like to see? The uh, classic Rust in Peace lineup, possibly getting back together. I don't see it happening. That's what the talk on the internet was. Well, that's that's I would like to see that too. But Marty Friedman has been pretty clear about his not having any need to come back to Megadeth. He's perfectly happy doing what he's doing, playing pop music in Japan. And Nick Menza, I know he's got some other project going on. And as far as I know, he and Dave weren't getting along. So. I don't know. But I would love if, to see it happen. Yes. What if it happens and then the crap that's been released from Megadeth the past couple of years is wiped away? They come out and they just hit hit us hard with something. Stranger things have happened, like Metallica and Megadeth getting along. So obviously anything's possible. But now you have to think when two members leave like this at the same time, something has serious has to be happening in that band. Could be. I don't know. We will see what happens. So this kind of came out of the blue, but next month in January, Napalm Death are going to be releasing a new album called Apex Predator. I know you're a big fan of Napalm Death, and by big fan, I mean not a big fan. I need to listen to them. I don't even know where to start with them. Yeah. I mean, they've got, they've been around for so long, and their sounds kind of evolved from the early days to, you know, the Barney years. Only album I know by that. What's that? Scum? Scum, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's considered a grindcore classic. Yeah, that early stuff's a little too raw for me, like some of the early, early carcass. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, some of the later stuff's not too bad. I mean, but you've never really been. A not a big fan, no. You know, I pick up the odd album every couple of years. I'll get a new one just to see how they're doing. I'll probably pick up this one. Another album coming out. Venom is going to be releasing From the Depths on January 27th. I call it Venom, but 
it's really just Kronos and some other dudes. I'm not sure what I think about that. Venom really hasn't been Venom for quite some time. I'm a big fan of the early Venom stuff. I've listened to some of the middle, later years stuff. And, you know, it's all right, but it's just, at this point, it's just Kronos. And while at least he's the singer, eh, you know, I think I'm just going to stick to the old stuff. Did you see this thing about Cannibal Corpse in Russia? Yeah. App- apparently, the translation of their lyrics has been ruled illegal because of the violent content. So you can probably, you can listen to Cannibal Corpse in English, apparently. But do not translate it into Russian, or you will be breaking the law. Yeah, not surprised with how they treat bands who are controversial. Over or anybody there. over there, for yeah. that matter. We like their hockey players, but... <laughs> yeah, it's about it. And, you know, vodka. <laughs> their government policy on uh, acceptance is kind of... <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. So, I don't know if you've heard this yet, but I just listened to the lyric video for Blind Guardian's new single, Twilight of the Gods. Did you hear this? mm I listened to it yesterday, and there was a glimmer of hope. I'm like, okay. You know, I sort of got out of them the last couple albums because... I have. It just kind of... It's all gang vocal, you know. I it's, like, all, it's all like... like sing song Yeah, exa- exactly. That's what I'm going for, yes. And it's like, I, I like the gang vocal as much as the next person, but they really were overusing it. It's like the half the song is gang vocal. And I'm just like, meh, I don't, I don't care about this. Very orchestral and uh, recently, as of late, a lot. Yeah, and I like that stuff, but they, they just kind of overused a it. Lot, like when I picture a lot of their songs now and how they've kind of evolved, it's kind of like when you're at a concert, you put your arms around the two guys next to you and you're just heave ho and singing along, you know? La, <laughs> la, 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 we'll all go down together. Yeah. <laughs> That's Billy Joel, by the way. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Good night, Saigon. Yeah, I th- yes. You see, look at that call. Look at that guy. My mom would be so proud. Yeah. Wow. Man, that's awesome. I, I called that. I can't believe you did that. <laughs> I'm a big Billy Joel fan, if, just in case you want to bash on me. I have his vinyls. I got yeah. like eight of them. Yeah, me too. But anyway. That's what's going with some points there. <laughs> <laughs> so I listened to the song, and it, they have gang vocals, but there was a lot of... A lot of like cool guitar stuff. The, the the production was really clean, and it wasn't overburdened with just you know ev- the kitchen sink and everything. The, the the song had a little more room to breathe. So you know, I the first half of the song, I was it was a lyric video. I was reading the lyrics along, and I shouldn't do that because then I'm paying t- more attention to what he's saying than what what's going on around it. And so I closed my eyes and listened to the second half of the song, and I had hope. So we'll see what happens. I, of course, immediately went out and pre-ordered the vinyl. <laughs> You're crazy. I also pre-ordered the Silosis vinyl. You're crazy. Uh, I know. So can I talk about lyrics real quick? I'm, I'm glad you just mentioned that. I was listening last night and on the way over here to the newest Josta episode. Okay. His podcast, his interviews are great. Uh, he was talking, did you hear, he was talking to Jesse from Kill Switch Engage. No, since I have started telecommuting for my oh, job, podcast I don't. I, my podcast listening has gone down dramatically. I need to yeah. figure out a way. I, I like listen to it in the car when I'm in the car. Even but when you're at your desk, just put on headphones and yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, I I've been so busy this month yeah, that it, I've had to focus on other things, and so even if I put it on, I'm not going to hear it. You know, podcasting just kind of in the background. Yeah, yeah. You can do that with music, but a podcast, if you're not paying attention, yep. it's not. You're not really going to get yep. anything out of it. Uh, but him and Jesse were talking about lyrics. Okay, and it kind of hit me maybe because I'm dense. Um, I don't really read lyric. No, I don't really ever find a connection with lyrics. Like this song's talking to me, man. Yeah. Uh, I never, again, I say I'm dense because I never read a couple lines and be like, oh, this means this, Mm -hmm. or what did he mean on this? I just listen to the songs to hear the song. Yeah. As much as Opeth I've listened to over the years, I've never even gone back and read the lyrics in depth and, you know, tried to see what's it mean. Yeah. it, it, It had me thinking, do you do that with lyrics at all? Not anymore. When I was a young lad in my teens in high school, I, you know, get a Metallica album, pour over the lyrics, learn every lyric, every Metallica song, every Megadeth song, every Slayer song. Because my world was so much smaller then, I could do that. I could realistically pick a couple of bands and just get that into them. But once I was in my 20s and I had more moolah to blow on music, I just went nuts. 
you know, and it hasn't ever slowed down. I'm just constantly consuming music, and there's no time for me to get that in depth. And frankly, a lot of the music I like, I don't really give a shit about the lyrics. I mean, like death metal, black metal. particularly death metal i mean unless it's cannibal corpse and i'm curious because they have some truly amusing ways to kill people in their you know mummified and barbed wire and something like you know i might read that just to get a laugh out of it or whatever but if otherwise i don't really care but there are the odd band out that for whatever reason either their vocals are intelligible enough that i make them out on my own or something about it makes me go to the lyric sheet that they really connect to me Mm mm-hmm great example woods of e prey those lyrics are a big part of why i'm such a big woods of e prey fan it's funny you mentioned josta that is actually one of the things that has pulled me into hate breed a little bit is that he's got cool empowering powerful lyrics and that's what he talks about on the episode and i'm like yeah you know okay I, i'm not a big fan of hardcore because it kind of all just oh, oh, you know they, they they scream they don't enunciate too much there's not a lot of dynamic range there and i tend to get bored but in the case of hate breed and josta the lyrics are cool enough that i'm like okay well this is a reason to to listen to it because i dig what he's saying i guess i'm i'm, I'm hearing the lyrics in the moment mm-hmm. uh, simple example that everybody listening here could understand if i throw out sentence or blah 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 no, it just could go over many people's heads sentence is another great Me- example metallica mm-hmm. disposable heroes right okay the lyrics are right there. The song's talking about, you know, soldiers charging in, you know, to battle. Yeah. The lyrics are cool. I'm hearing them right there in that moment. I could, you know, you could picture the visual yeah. going along with the song. But as soon as that next track goes on, I'm not still saying, oh, man, that was deep. Right. Now, I, well, you know, like one of the greatest heavy metal songs of all time, as far as I'm concerned, Angel of Death by Slayer. The lyrics do have meaning i mean you know you know about the uh, dr mangala and auschwitz and things like that those are deep and meaningful lyrics but at the same time if you're not a fan of history or you just don't give a crap you can get into angel of death and rock your ass off without giving a crap about what the song's about and that's kind of tragic in a way but it's not essential to to get into the music yeah so listening to this episode it made me think maybe you know if I, and I, we, we can do this more with vinyl, is that if, you know, we're sitting there with our nice speakers or headphones, mm-hmm. you can sit there, open the vinyl, and really, just like the old days, yep. sit there and just read along yep. again. So maybe I need to start going back and doing that more. I just wanted to get your take on, on the lyrics. Yeah, because I find that the, the songs and the albums that I make that connection to are the ones that stand out to me more and mean more to me in the long run. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, obviously, you know, do what you will, yeah, but... because it was weird, because I, I heard this interview, and I thought, hey, when I listen to music, I'm just listening to the music. Mm-hmm. You know, the lyrics are just, to me, part of the music. I, I've never, again, heard something and be like, wow, do you just hear, hear that line? It's because not everybody, ha- you know, some lyrics are, they have a cause, or, you know, I mean, a cause like, oh, you know, we're protesting... Whatever. Human rights or whatever. And if you're not part of that cause, then it doesn't mean anything to you. But some people are looking for that cause or that. If you haven't had really relationship problems, a song talking about relationships, you wouldn't understand. If you haven't had depression and loneliness and, you know. Exactly. It, it, you know, you can like a song without relating to the content of the song. But when you do relate to it, that's when it really makes a connection. Hmm. Cool. Right on. And to finish up the news here, I, uh, you know, we had spent on like a lot of episodes in our short run here, 19 episodes in, about talking about Opeth and my love for them. And they released their newest album this year, a couple months back, Pale Communion. I've had mixed things about it, where it'll end up on my list. If it ends up on my metal albums of the year list, uh, I will take some serious thought. But there was talk, like there always is talk with Opeth in recent years as if they're done with the heavy stuff. And I just wanted to make note that here George and I are recording this on a Saturday that uh, earlier this week, this the 4th, Opeth kicked off their tour with In Flames here in the States, and they only played two songs off of the new album. Really? Yep. And the rest was off of the rest uh, Heritage. Were, I'm not going <laughs> to spoil it for anybody. If, you wanna, if you're if you curious, you know, come back in 20 seconds. But they played Drapery Falls, 
The Moor off of uh, Still Life, Window Pain off of Damnation, The Lotus Eater off of Window Pain, and Deliverance. Lotus Eater off of which? Window, sorry, Watershed. Thank you. Even I know that one. Come I on. I, I'm sorry. So, you know, three s- softer songs and the rest True Opeth. But did they sing them with a growl? They have videos of, no, the videos that and I take this story from uh, Skulls and Bones. They have videos of them playing these songs at various times uh-huh. over the years. I, I would, would I would assume you can't play Deliverance, one of their heaviest songs, and not. Yeah, that would even Mike would not have the balls to go and be like, "All right, we're we're going to retool these all to have clean vocals now." <laughs> <laughs> that would seriously. I'd have to take a look at the band if they were to ever do that. I'd be curious to hear it just like once. You know, just to be like, hey, what's this sound like with clean vocals? But, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I, th- he's got to be doing it with the harsh has vocals. To. Has to. So, if you were wondering, yeah, they're playing the old stuff. They're on tour now with uh, In Flames and Red Fang. They're not coming here because I would be there. But yeah. I can't believe they're not coming here. I don't understand it. Weird. All right. Well, <laughs> we've actually been going quite a while now, and we still have to get into the new releases. So let's check that out. There's not much. I was really scraping the barrel here because this is that time of year when music releases just kind of slow down until January. Last episode, what I was listening to was Eye of Solitude and their Dear Insanity EP. Mm-hmm. One long 50-minute song. That came out this past week. There's another band, Moore's Principium Est dawn of the fifth era kind of death metal melodic death metal sort of stuff i've heard them before i haven't actually listened to this one yet but uh i've heard them before in the past and it was pretty good there's a samael reissue of solar soul not one of my favorite albums from the band (laughs) but there you have it and then this next band they're called triosphere and they're releasing their new album the heart of the matter not a huge fan of the band but i bought their last album when i was in norway they're from trondheim and I don't think I was actually in Trondheim. I think it was in Tromso at the time when I bought it. But, you know, it was a Norwegian band that I bought in Norway. So it has a little special place in my heart. And so I thought I would mention that they have a new album out. Finally, there's two Voivod re-releases. Infini and Kators are both being reissued this week as well. And uh, nothing really excites me this week. Just like I've told before, I'm a big video game guy. Video game releases for the year are pretty much done right now. Maybe the occasional indie release or something comes out. Yeah. But this, you know, holiday season, probably to about, what, February? No, so. January's got some good stuff. Oh, I wow. Mean, uh, you know, Blind Guardian's coming out in January, and uh, Silosis is coming out in oh, January, yeah. and Napalm Death is coming out in January. So January picks up again. Can I mention a new release? Actually, was it last week? The new EP from Early Man? Yes. Did you hear that thing? Yes. That's- oh, man, Mike. Oh, Oh, that is amazing. We should probably get the frickin' title of it. Yeah, that new Early Man EP is called You Fancy Me Mad, and there's three new songs on there. <sighs> when Mike was on here, he was talking about how he's just going to start, you know, releasing, like, EPs, like, constantly and be just incredibly prolific. Hopefully he doesn't oversaturate, mm-hmm. you know, because that, that is something that you have to be uh, concerned about. It's not something most bands have to be concerned about these days because nobody releases shit anymore. It's like three years between albums. But I'm always on board for more early man, so check that out. You know, he just put out the Halloween EP on Halloween, mm-hmm. and now here we are, a little over a month later. Boom, another EP. So check that out. You yeah. can get that on Bandcamp. I, it's like five bucks for a download. Yeah, it's it's really really good. So uh, we're gonna get into an interview now. I had the pleasure. I was not spur of the moment, but unfortunately, George wasn't able to join me because of my doing and because Cam lives in Vancouver. So there's a three hour time span where he's behind us. You know, he works. So a weeknight at like one o'clock interview with Cam. For those of you again who don't know, I'll say it again. He's the lead singer of Three Inches of Blood, a almost return to classic new wave of of British heavy metal type of sound. That three inches of blood have had that's our has uh his falsetto vocals mm-hmm. um, are definitely at the forefront of the band the various you know lyrical topics from fantasy to hockey <laughs> yeah <laughs> to, uh to, to fantasy hockey <laughs> to you know this song about uh storm and juno beach in world war ii yeah 
So this interview we, we talk about, they earlier this year released a documentary called Three Inches of Blood, Warriors of the Great White North. Uh, and this documentary uh, was Cam's friend filmed them on, in a van as they went around uh, touring Canada. So we're, you're hearing this interview, you know, we talk talk about the band, what, what they're doing. The band right now is kind of in a hiatus where they, you know, they're each in their various jobs and stuff like that. They kind of got a little burnt out from the re- relentless touring okay. that they had been doing. Uh, again, they're not throwing in the towel. They're just taking some time off right now. Uh, so you could, again, we're putting Clyde in the notes, but Vimeo, I think, is the site. Okay, so you, you can watch it on there? You can watch it on there, and it costs like three bucks. Sweet, I'll be doing that. Yep, so here we go. Let's Here's the interview with Cam Pipes of Three Inches of Blood. All right, we'll see you after. Okay, this is MetalDisciple.com's Metalheads Podcast, and this is Buke, and I'm flying solo tonight. I am joined by Cam Pipes from my favorite group, Three Inches of Blood. What's going on, Cam? Oh, you know, just uh, hanging out. <laughs> just hang, hanging out, huh? Yeah. Uh, I just got done watching. Uh, first start off, I just got done watching my... Uh, capitals inch past the uh avalanche there so i just have to ask you to start you uh okay are you happy with the uh vancouver season so 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 far yeah i've i've got the uh i've got the game on pause right now against anaheim because they're going at overtime so i'm just uh waiting on that i've uh <laughs> missed i've missed pretty much the whole game being uh out all night but listening to bits uh, am, and pieces I, on the I'm, radio i'm not gonna spoil it and i'm, I'm not yeah. gonna i'm not gonna take you a lot from it you know no uh, no problem man quick it's just on pause, to, so i can watch it whenever <laughs> hey i'm gonna say work and evening shift i watch every single game on yeah. dvr so for awesome. uh the listeners out there i just want to you guys have heard me saying numerous times that Three inches of blood uh, in the twenty years or so I've been listening to metal is my favorite group in metal next to Opeth uh, that's come out. Uh, you want to give a little history for yourself about the band and uh, the type of sound that you you guys have for maybe people who haven't heard. Uh, well, the best the best way to describe us really is the word we're a heavy metal band just <laughs> that's pure it pure and simple i mean that's really the best way to describe it our influences are very classic and traditional so uh that's um uh, i think that's what you'll hear if you've never heard us before so yeah um yeah. it's really best way to describe it we don't uh i mean people have lumped us into their made up sub or yeah. whatever but uh you know i think just now, now cam for those who, for those who metal, haven't heard you know, you know your your voice is the best in metal, in my opinion, uh, high pitched. You. you know, high pitched one that you associate with, like uh, Rob Halford, or King Diamond. Has has that something that throughout the years you've had to try and uh, carve out your own name, or people just say, "Oh, you're just trying to be a, uh, you're just trying to be the next King." No, people. No one's ever accused me of trying to be like somebody. They, you know, I just get a lot of people saying, "Oh, you remind me of this guy," or you are you influenced by this guy because you sound a lot like him yeah and uh yeah so no one's ever ever tried to like call me out and and call me some kind of imitator um you know which is uh which is awesome but uh and and it's it's equally awesome that definitely uh, compared to guys like you know rob halford or king diamond and uh guys like that guys who i love was was that something when you first started singing you just naturally went with I guess I didn't try and emulate anybody. That's just kind of how it came out. I just uh, developed it on my own. When I first joined the band, I was really not very well uh, trained. I mean, I've never Uh had training, but I guess I've never really sung in a band like this before. It was just something I could kind of do. Just kind of driving in my car, singing along to... uh, you know, aforementioned bands, uh, King Diamond being like a, a, a big one, actually. Um, just hitting those screams on uh, songs off Abigail were were kind of like my favorites. So, um, you know, it, it, it's it's something that in the early days of the band, I just kind of developed and worked on myself and found my own voice, as it were. And yeah, and uh, if, I, I think. Over the albums, especially compared to our first record, uh, Battle Cry, to then to Advance and Vanquish, I think there's a very huge jump in in my the way my vocals sound. Um, 
I can hear it, yes. And I, I think that that just came with time and playing more shows and, and collectively just getting better at writing songs. So um, knowing what I had on my hands and then knowing what to do with it were, uh, were things I had to learn. Yep. Now, when you joined... Uh when you guys formed, you know, when you started putting out Battle Cry Under a Winter Sun, were you uh, one of the first members with the group and the guys then? No. Uh, I came into it. The, they hadn't really been uh, active for that long, but they were all guys I knew. Mm-hmm. Um, we were all living in the same city uh, at the time, and um, eventually, uh, you know, they just kind of got wind of me being able to do falsetto vocals and um back in the back then like three inches of blood was very heavily into the uh you know gallopy kind of iron maiden style Mm -hmm. and uh no one at least in our neck of the woods and um from what i can tell like in in Canada or, or maybe even the U.S. No one here in the States around me that I could think of. Yeah, like, this was, like, late 90s. Like, no one was really doing that. Like, and no new bands were doing that anyway. So, um, uh, Jamie Hooper was the only vocalist. He he was, you know, a, a, you know, a, a hardcore, you know, screamer kind of guy. Like, he, he didn't... He can do falsettos. Like, um, you can hear it in some of the, like, really, like, way older stuff. Um, but, uh, he, he didn't really lean towards that too much. So I think with what they were playing with this, you know, kind of gallopy, you know, new wave of British heavy metal style, um, uh, you know, being friends with them, they heard like, Oh, I heard you can do falsettos. Like, do you want to, you want to do some guest vocals on a song (laughs) on our, on our demo? So I was like, okay, cool. And, uh, um, after they heard it, they were like, oh, that's that's great. Do you want to do it on the whole demo? <laughs> so I was like, all right. How do, you, do I have, do you want to give me some direction on what you want me to put in there? And they're like, oh, you know, just do whatever you want, pretty much. So um, I, I, I sort of consulted Jamie. I'm like, okay, what are the lyrics of the song? And more or less, I just almost doubled what he was already doing, okay. but just with what I was doing. And, uh, you know, it was fun, uh, just laying that down. Um, and, uh, I, I, I never, I thought the idea of being in the band was, was, would be really cool, but I didn't want to like step on anyone's toes. I'm like, well, they've already got a singer. They probably don't want two singers. And then eventually one day they're like, Hey, do you want to join the band as a second vocalist? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, totally. No, uh, no. By that point, a lot of them had moved to Vancouver, uh, from Victoria, uh, where we were at the time I'd been living in Victoria for, you know, 12 years or so and that was kind of I wasn't doing anything musically at the time and I was just like this is my out I need to get out of this city and <laughs> so I made the leap and uh, moved to Vancouver um, with um, the rest um, of them. unless you could skate you know maybe you could be like you know a tough guy role you know <laughs> yeah I, and I couldn't skate like I <laughs> oh come on a lot of them did actually most of those guys uh um who were in the band with me at the time they did skateboard but uh not uh not me i used to you know back in the 80s yeah. I, I did a little bit when i was a kid but uh i never was really very good at it i still have that old skateboard that i uh <laughs> that i grew up with but it's uh cracked but i so, still maintain it just for like memories you know so then the the, <laughs> the band moves and that's right around what's it the 2003 2002 time or is this still the 90s uh, we i i joined the band in early 2001 and by that point, um, uh, most of them had been living in Vancouver for a little while. Um, it was just myself and, uh, the bass player, um, we're still in Victoria, but we both moved over to Vancouver about the same time. And then we just kind of went at it and just started playing shows and, uh, in Vancouver area and, you know, eventually got onto booking our own tours and doing a DIY for a little while. And, uh, you know, things just kind of happened and. And then, and then where this is where you guys burst on my scene. Uh, tooth, two, what's it? Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 2004, is it? Advance and Vanquish comes out. That's right. And you know, us as metalheads, I, I speak for a lot of us. You know, when there's so many bands out there and so many albums out, while they're good, it just sounds the same. Advance mm-hmm. and Vanquish was the first time I had heard you guys, and it was instantly, and I've only had a couple. It was that instant you put it on, 
and you're like, holy shit, <laughs> this is amazing. Well, thank you. Did you guys realize in the metal world that that little, uh, uh, you know, something different that you guys had touched off here with this record, really? Well, I don't know if we maybe realized it. I don't, I think, uh, obviously there was something that we must have known was was special about it because you know roadrunner records was calling and other labels were taking interest um so we're like oh okay um we had done like a few tours at that point you know including one fairly high profile tour in the uk which maybe garners us garnered us a little bit more attention from labels um but uh you know we knew the songwriting was getting better and we were progressing and um i think things just kind of happened in within the span of a couple of years from all right we're doing some tours and uh we never really thought we would go very far with it we we certainly didn't rule out the possibility um and you know we certainly were into taking opportunities and um all of a sudden we're signed to Roadrunner Records and we're recording a an album with a you know really well-known producer in uh, you know Neil Kernan and who you know his resume speaks for himself and we were like yeah. you know it, this was all like really new to us and it, um but uh you know th- th- things happen the way they do and you just kind of got to roll with it and it's it's all a matter of whether you're equipped to handle it and whether you're that's what you want to do and yep. uh um most of us were wanting to you know it, it, that 2004 was a very pivotal time for us um a lot happened in that year <laughs> some a lot some good some <laughs> uh very uh i mean i wouldn't wouldn't say bad necessarily but very strenuous strenuous and you know stressful you, a lot of a, a lot of a lot of things happened. Do you, you know. now, do you think the uh, location where you guys were coming? And I, I ask this because you know I'm here in DC area. I must have seen you guys three, four times right around the 2004, 2005 area. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we'll talk about later, you guys released this amazing documentary. Uh, was it hard being up north? traveling throughout the states with this grueling schedule in the bus is that what started putting strain on the group that some of the guys just maybe it's just, just they were realizing it wasn't for for them well i don't know i uh, well we never really toured in buses so much we were, were mainly a van no, no, sorry van. if i said bus i i meant van that's <laughs> fine um but there is a there is for listeners out there there is a huge difference um Touring in a van is not for everybody. It is very, very hard. Um, touring in a bus is very expensive. We have done bus tours when they were, uh, it was reasonable within our budget and the situation. Um, Ozfest in, in 07 was uh, kind of the, or was that 08? I'm trying to, I think it was I, <laughs> seven. Oh, seven. I, I, I it was think 07. it was yeah. Oh, oh, seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was oh seven. It, we we toured in a bus. We shared a bus, you know, to cut costs. But that's one of those tours where, um, I, I won't get into the specifics why, but uh, and a lot of it has to do with you know uh, refuge from the from the elements and so forth. <laughs> oh, and, it's brutal those those yeah. days. Those are the kind of tours where. You're, there's a lot of night, night drives. You need your sleep, and if you're not, then uh, you're you're pretty much shooting yourself in the foot um, in terms of jeopardizing your performance or whatever. But uh, um, getting back to the uh, the point at hand, um, you know, I think I don't know if it was necessarily the vehicle thing, but just to being in a touring band is not for everybody. It's it's really hard slogging it out, especially in those early days when you're paying your dues, you're not making much money. Uh, you can't really afford to have crew unless you've got buddies who are willing to work for basically nothing or, or, or chump change, you know, just a per diem, like five mm-hmm. bucks, five mm-hmm. bucks a day here and there. And, um, yep. there a lot of, a lot of hard lessons learned. Um, but even before we were at that point of promoting advanced bankers, there's just, uh, guys who just 
either weren't cut out for it and we had to, you know, make some changes or it was, uh, people who were just their hearts weren't into it they didn't want to they were already getting fed up with the business aspect of things they had other ambitions and what have you and that's mostly what it's been um with people who've uh been in this band and then left they just weren't into it for for what the, uh, for whatever reason or another they liked playing the music but um they had other things on their mind other ambitions mm-hmm. they didn't want to be away so much um um, yeah, only one guy we've ever had to fire, but, uh, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not for everybody <laughs> that that's really I, what it boils down. I, to. I, I could imagine it, you know, um, was, you know, you, you had just joined the band, you know, years earlier had, had prior to the tours around here. Had you even done any major touring like this? Mm, not nothing really nothing that i call major anyway okay. um i i'd done a couple of tours down the west coast with uh a, a couple of different bands so i still didn't really know what it was all about i was still we i mean we were all pretty green and we'd uh we'd done little bits of diy touring now and the, here and there and that sort of gets you prepared a little bit um but until you're on a tour with, you know, a bigger a bigger band and 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 see the way their their production is and their crew and 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 just kind of learning the ropes and and learning not to be so green and and learn know, learn to know your place, be appreciative for what you're getting because you're getting good exposure. Yeah, and I uh, in fact the, the the first time I met you, it always stays with me. It was at Jack's in Springfield, mm-hmm. VA. It's now a different name, but uh, yeah. I, I walked in and you were selling your your shirts, mm-hmm. and if if I talked to you for thirty minutes, you were more than willing to talk to me. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, why not? The, <laughs> you you can have to be there anyway, right? People, pe- yeah. I mean, regardless of whether I'm at the merch table or what, like we're we're usually hanging out. What are we going to do? Just sit in our van and or this like you know dressing room, or even if the, if there is a dressing room, sometimes there just isn't. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're out and about, we're there to hang out and meet people and, and interact and, um, you know, on and off stage. So, um, it, 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 when you're not at the show, when you're not at the venue and you're not on stage, it's really, it can be really boring. A lot of touring is just driving. So to have that interaction with people is, uh, you know, that's, that's part of what we, why we do it because you're there to see us play and we're there to entertain you. So yeah, we want to, we want to talk to you and hear what you had thought about the show and what your favorite songs are. And, 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 you know, kind of <laughs> like say, Oh, sorry. When you say like, Oh, why didn't you play this song? I love that song. And be like, Oh, maybe next time. Yeah, I've still <laughs> never know? seen Just you guys it, play revenge is a vulture. <laughs> yeah. And we, we've done that on, on lots of tours, probably, I don't know when the last time you saw us was, but uh, we've played it fairly recently, I guess. Maybe not the last tour we did. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe the one before it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and that's another thing we like to keep in mind is um, we're, we may do a set list that uh, is the same for a whole tour, but then we're, we're usually pretty mindful of uh, songs we haven't played on it like since the tour before so we'll throw in some songs and then we'll put some on the shelf and there's ones we always keep in there and uh you know uh that's just stuff we're conscious of ourselves we don't have to necessarily always ask the fans like yeah hey uh (laughs) you know we're gonna do an online poll tell us you know you pick our set list for this tour and like and which and that's a cool idea we just haven't actually done that but um you know, sometimes people are like, oh, are you playing this song tonight? And um, I'll be like, I'm not sure. And because I don't like to give away too much about what's our I our never look beforehand. I, like, I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, my my partner George, who I normally do the podcast with, he uh, will look up a set list and then he'll put the whole set list on his iPod and like <laughs> do some concert prep. Yeah, right. I said, no, George, you want to – like when we saw King Diamond a couple weeks ago, I said, George, I was so hyped to see Abigail. I was excited. I was looking forward to it. He didn't even fucking play it. 
<laughs> but George knew that was going to happen. I yeah. like that that waiting, and then hey, if it happens, it's a great moment. Uh-huh. If not, hey, it it doesn't happen. Well, one of the one of the benefits we have sometimes of uh, of uh, being a band at our level is when we're doing a tour. If we're if we're not doing a headliner, um, sometimes we will get those days off from the main tour where we are doing our own headlining shows. So we'll we'll prepare set like headlining sets. We'll prepare. Uh, 30 minute sets or like we'll, we'll know in advance usually of how long our set's going to be for a whole tour. And some nights it'll change. Sometimes you'll get an extra five minutes. So be like, okay, we'll throw this song in. So there's always songs that we're kind of rotating usually as well. And we'll say, okay, we'll play this one tonight or that one went really well last night. So we'll do it again. Or like someone wants to hear this song. We didn't play it the past couple of nights. So we'll hear this one, you know? Um, like fans will say, oh, are you going to play this? And we're like, well, I don't know, maybe. And then someone will come in the dressing room and be like, hey, there's a guy who's asking if we'll play this song. <laughs> so we'll do that. So sometimes we do those little little requests. And um, maybe they they won't necessarily know that we threw it in the set list because mm-hmm. of them. But, uh, you know, if there's people listening who have ever asked us that and we have ended up playing, then <laughs> there's, a, there's a decent enough chance that we put it in there because somebody asked. And you know what? Maybe one night just working into like a three inches of blood bed of like you know your own little medley uh-huh. <laughs> just rock in well, like f- three or four songs into one we've never actually done anything quite like that the only thing similar would be we've thrown in a piece of a rush song here and there of um, into of like the end of a song <laughs> and then leading it into one song into an uh, into another so so I, now maybe now going now going with your songs here maybe i have uh you know, read the lyrics and interpreted them wrong. If I have, great. Uh, I recommend everybody listening to follow you on Instagram, follow you on Twitter at Cam Pipes. Uh, reason being, me personally, I like you. I'm a tabletop gamer. I mm-hmm. have been playing D and D for years. Is the subject matter? Is it you putting your own hand in it with the the fantasy uh, world that you you know spend your free time sometime involved with? Well, I've been asked before if D&D influenced my lyric writing, and I'm going to have to say no, because um, I've never been the DM when I've played D&D. I've always been a player, so I've never been in control of the story of any of the uh, campaigns I've been involved in. Um, You know, maybe some of the imagery within the game or just you know words way the dm has described certain stuff maybe that's you know influenced me indirectly but uh you know i've never written a song based on any D campaigns and, um and that you know that probably will surprise some people but uh, it's it, that's a i'm learning something new there i never uh-huh. never would have known that uh, and it's not that I w- am opposed to anything like that it's just the 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 campaigns i'm usually involved in are very Open ended. There's not usually really any endings. Uh, you know, players come and go. DMs change their mind on what rule sets uh. they want to <laughs> go with, and they go, "Oh, we're going to try a different you know world this day." Everybody roll up a first level <laughs> character, which is kind of annoying because I hate playing first level characters. They're so way too vulnerable. Oh, very, enough, very much but, so. Uh, so um, you know, th- it's the amount of them trying to keep it interesting, or maybe they just want to. <laughs> grab something new. <laughs> Have you had a chance to look at the new rule set that came out? I know you play. What you you still play second edition, right? Yeah, like I started playing three point five about uh, ten years ago. Um, did that for a while. Then the guys I play with decided to switch to fourth edition when it came out. Did that for almost a year. They weren't really feeling it too much, so we reverted back to uh, first edition AD and D. And that's pretty much the basis of what we play now, except for um, the uh, DMs kind of throwing in their own little rules here mm-hmm. and there. But uh, um, you know, I have guys who they'll they'll revert back to O D and D uh, and wow. or or something that's not even you know uh, a necessarily a traditional like D twenty rule set, but they just kind of do their own thing, and you know there's 
you know, you'll only use like six or 12 siders sometimes. Like there's <laughs> not even D20s involved, but it's all, you know, it's all role playing still. Now, uh, going back to obviously the uh, music here for the band, when you guys released uh, your two albums, uh, right? I say in the middle of where I'm, uh, your most recent Long Live Heavy Metal, Fire Up the Blades and Here Waits Thy Doom. Uh, from from you know uh, avid fan of you guys, it seems those were records where you guys were kind of tr- not trying to find your footing, but trying to find the sound or the direction of the group. Is that a uh, correct statement to make for those albums? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. we've never really approached our songwriting in terms of a direction we're going for or or an idea it's it's always just been we'll go to the jam spot some we've got some riffs let's see where they go and we just stick with what we liked you know we never it's that's that's really the only way to put it okay. it's really uh not really much to elaborate on it <laughs> other than that um, we we don't think about repeating ourselves or or wanting to emulate you know past success of uh, of of some sort. We're not going in there thinking like oh we need to write another Deadly Sinners or something mm-hmm. like that. So um, we've always been very you know we're doing what we like, and for the most part we've been with labels that are supportive of that for the most part, and you know any. Uh, you know, creative control that has been tried to be exerted other than by anyone in the band has been met with much resistance and sometimes a little hostility. And it's always been like, okay, they back off. Mm -hmm. So, um, (laughs) because we're like, you know, you, you heard the demos the way they are, the the way they are. And we haven't changed the songs from demo to recording (laughs) the master. And now you're saying you want, something different so the middle finger goes up and then they back off and say okay um but luckily that's only happened like like once or twice wow now fa- fast forward here we are to you know long live heavy metal you guys most recent album came out a couple years back i even though advance and vanquish is my favorite i think a uh, long live heavy metal is uh your guys' years of experience now is definitely shining through. This is a perfect ten out of ten in my my book. Uh, cool. The song "Look Look Out Alone" is oh amazing work on that. Do you have uh, anything? It sounds like again with this album, you guys just went to the studio and just decided you were going to sit down and just do a kick ass album, right? Yeah, I mean it, this was an album that was written probably faster than any other record we've done before. Um, and probably recorded a lot quicker than any records we've done. And you I would not I know can't, by listening to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't explain why, but it's just kind of what happened. We were we were writing it in the in the fall of uh, 2011, and it was uh, we were in a very cold uh, rehearsal building, and it's just one of those things. I mean, we didn't. Uh, we did kind of set out a rough guideline of when we wanted to be in the studio and we were, there was a little bit of a crunch, you know, it was a a little bit uh, stressful at times thinking about like, okay, shit, we got to finish this up. We got to go into the studio. We don't, we wanted to have songs done by the time we hit the studio. Um, If not, you know, have them done by the time we started pre-production. There were a few, well, a couple of skeletons, that were still, uh, you know, hadn't been totally fleshed out by the time we hit pre-production. And they weren't 100% done by the time we finished pre-production. Uh, you know, there were lyrics that I was still writing while uh, the guys were laying down the mm, uh, wow. the bed tracks for the, you know, with the drums and all that stuff. So there were a couple of songs that I had, l- by the time I was ready to go, all the lyrics were done. I just hadn't necessarily arranged a couple of songs, uh, how the, uh, you know, I, I hadn't really arranged them with the music quite yet. Um, the lookout was one of them actually. And those were songs that, uh, um, I just kind of like, okay, this is what I think I'm going to do. And I've just kind of went for it. Let's go for and, it. uh, so with a little bit of trial and error and figuring out, okay, that kind of 
vocal pattern and that melody doesn't really <laughs> quite work. And um, Justin actually ha- was pretty instrumental in uh, helping with the way some of the vocals were arranged on that one. Okay. And Men of Fortune being the other one, that was like the last song that we wrote before uh, before going into the studio, which was probably the end. The way it turned out was probably the big surprise of all. But, uh, you know, those last two, like, um, we just kind of, you know, we, we, we didn't think too much about like, oh shit, like we're really pressed for time. And, uh, it, it was, it was, we were making good progress, like when it came down to actually laying down those uh, newer ones that were, you know, a little less familiar, but, uh, you know, we're, we're very pleased with how, how they turned out and we're, you know, ecstatic with how the whole record turned out it was just very surprising at uh, the overall result and you know i think we probably we all thought we did made our strongest record and you know it was uh it wasn't yeah. this like crazy like ups and downs that, that like <laughs> struggle to get the thing done and it, it was just kind of a it it was what it was and uh it was it turned out really cool yeah not to say i lost faith in you guys i uh, along with a bunch of fans I talked to, uh, right around you know the time Jamie left and stuff, we were like, God, are this three inches of blood? What will they change into? Will they change? Will they still even be around? Was that talked about when Jamie left? If you guys still go on, um, more so in the aspect of like how are the fans going to react? And um, from from the time Fire of the Blades came out. Jamie hard well Jamie first started getting his you know voice problems about the time we were recording Fire of the Blades and then uh subsequently toured right after it was done uh but uh, the, the, from when it was done to when it was released there was about a 6 month gap so um we toured for about three months straight right after we recorded just because you know we had these good opportunities come up um and then it was in that time that we got offered Ozfest, and then uh you know these issues started coming up with you know jamie's having trouble with his voice um and saying i i don't think i should tour for a little while should like recoup so justin you know like a champ just said fuck i'll do it um, and Pete sang in bands before I'd been in bands with, with him before where mm-hmm. he'd sang. So I knew he had, he was able to do it cause he's, you know, he just said he had to little, you know, practice a little bit doing guitar and vocals and being able to do these complex riffs and do some of the, uh, the, the vocal patterns I needed to, uh, some stuff I needed to take out, take on a bit of Jamie's parts too. But, uh, um, you know, did it in my own own sort of way, but we adapted and we did really well, I think. And uh, um, after it became clear, like, well, Jamie's not going to be doing this for a while, if ever again. Um, and we just kind of soldiered on, not really thinking too much about it, because we thought we were we were doing fine. Uh, we weren't uh, struggling. People were like naturally curious about where he was and how he was doing. And if he was coming back, we're just like, yeah, this is what's going on. Um, and the reactions were very encouraging, though. And they're saying, well, you know, we like his vocals, we miss him, but you know, you guys certainly are sound great still. So that was validation enough when it finally came down to Jamie saying, look, um, you know, I I don't think I'm going to be able to do this anymore. And we said, okay. Yep. Now, that's the, the way it is. Now, you you mentioned at the start of that answer there that you know you were a little worried what the the fans think. You know, we we see it every year. Uh, most recently, you know, in news a couple months back, uh, when Opeth was getting ready to release their album, you know, they said, "Hey, this is like a '70s prog sound," and hey, I, I honestly, we're gonna play whatever we like to play. Uh, have you, as an artist, and now you know in the band. Uh, are you afraid or just are you apprehensive of trying something drastic or new for what you guys may want to do in the future? Um, not really. I used to be about, uh, the way certain song ideas were presented. I used to think like, Oh, well, that's not really, 
you know, our style that's a little more outside the box, but, you know, ultimately, uh, we, we wanted to give it a shot. We didn't want to pigeonhole ourselves and do sounding a certain way. I mean, I, I think we, you can look, listen to all our records and think, and, and, and find like, okay, that's, you know, it's three inches of blood, but yet each album is kind of its own, has its own sound in a way. So no, some people have uh, heard some songs that we've, that may be a little bit different, like, uh, you know, like Infinite Legions on, on Fire of the Blades has like lots of blast beats. That was, uh, that was just something that we were, that was another song we were just kind of wrote in pre-production and we needed uh, we needed some more songs <laughs> so we're <laughs> someone just started jamming out a riff and you know just things kind of went from there and it ended up being more of a uh you know fast kind of well like it's blast beats like we don't we don't really <laughs> we're not really known for doing blast beats no. <laughs> yeah and then and then you've got a song like preacher's daughter off here waits thy doom which is very more you know rock and roll a little more, I don't know. It's it's it's, it, but it's definitely something that stands out from songs on that record and and even on any other song we've done. So, uh, but then people will tell us, "Oh, I love this song. This is my favorite song off that record," or "This is my favorite song that you've done." Um, so, from a whole song, even 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 little ideas like Justin wanting to bring in some keyboards. Um, you know, that never really bothered me. I, I've always liked the sound of keyboards. I know the kind of place he was coming from when he first said, Oh, I want to put some heavy keyboards in here. a la John Lord, deep purple. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay, that'd probably sound pretty yeah. cool. So, uh, we've always tried, we, we've ended up putting some on the past few records <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, and, and the people responded well to it. So, um, nothing's really backfired and like, you know, blown up in our faces in that respect. So yeah. Why? And they're thinking about, you know, speaking about songs throughout the disc, why hasn't the NHL contacted you guys to have leave it on the ice, be the anthem for the fricking NHL? Uh, well, you know how they, you know, this whole debate about taking fighting out of the game yeah. is one of the, <laughs> what is, what is your personal take on it? Uh, it's, it's gotta, it's gotta be there. It's part of the entertainment value. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um, it's, 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 yeah, I mean, it's something no other sport really has. Um, and you know, when it happens, it's not like, oh shit, uh, they're like, you know, the, you know, you're like, you're like, yeah, okay, fight. And it's, it's usually pretty short anyway, yeah. which kind of sucks, but it, it really gets the crowd amped up. It gets the team amped up. That's a, another reason why they do it. I mean, I don't really like the staged fighting where they're just kind of like, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah uh -huh. you know then, gonna are we going to do this? Exactly. We're do this. I, I like it. The fighting to re be a result of something like a dirty hit, or like you know, you you slew foot the goalie, or something like that, and then and then a fight breaks out. Then it's like, yeah. Then it's like uh, retribution. It's not just like, okay, let's give these guys a show, or we need to get our teams fired up. So hey, you, let's let's you and me fight. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's still I still like seeing it regardless, <laughs> but the re the the motivation or the or the the reason behind a particular fight may not be quite hey i don't, I don't have a problem watching liking. stupid george peros get his face bashed in a couple oh, times <laughs> yeah. there's there's yeah there's some guys who you just like to see go at it <laughs> uh now it over the over the years uh you know i guess a couple more questions i'll let you go uh you know the music industry as a whole has totally changed with you know you know it way better than i do uh you know now we live in this age where people Except, you know, it seems metal fans, but people are buying singles here. They're doing streaming stuff. What is your whole take on where the industry is going now? And um, are you guys on board with whatever? Ultimately, you know, you're at the record label's discretion, right? Mm -hmm, I guess so. Um, honestly, whatever our next release is, I, I kind of hope it doesn't come out on CD. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> because I don't really see the point anymore. People are just going to, they're either going to download it or they're just going to like rip it on their computer and throw it on their iPod or, or whatever. And like, like how many people have, a, who listens to CDs at home anymore? I mean, I don't have no a one. CD player in my house. Nope. How many people listen? I mean, unless you're just listening to it on your computer um, which you don't really need to have the CD for there unless you're just, unless you throw it on your iTunes and then you shelve the CD, right? So it's kind of seems like a, a pointless, 
a bit of manufacturing now when you can cut down on that cost and just uh you know do the digital download or 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 stick with the vinyl i'm a big fan of vinyl so am i I, so am i so i i like having that there's always like cool uh stuff you can do with vinyl with like special packaging and limited edition kind of uh stuff so i think i like that kind of thing but uh you know people are still going to grab it off their computers in, in some form or another and now i know uh there's a lot to be said about having the physical packaging and you know the artwork and all this stuff and uh, and i and i totally agree with that but i mean that's where that's where at least the vinyl kind of maintains that aspect at least better sound quality so, yeah and and you get the download copy when you want to take it on the go and you got the nice audio quality when you're sitting there at the house and you want to look through it on the couch yeah exactly so that's that's sort of where i my stand on it Okay. Um, as long as the vinyl's still there, um, you know, that's always going to be something cool. And even if people are just like, oh, but I don't have a record player. And then it's like, well, it comes with a download card, which, you know, <laughs> most of the time it did does now. It's like, you got a record player, you at least got the artwork, you got something cool to look at. And maybe, especially like with, if you get a record early on in its release, then sometimes the, the first press will be on like colored vinyl or be like mm-hmm. hand numbered and it'll, or picture desk or something like something special about it right off the bat. Now for, uh, will we ever see Advance and Vanquish on vinyl? Yeah, you know, it's been Advance and Vanquish and Fire Up the Blades have been, we've been sort of working on it um, uh, with a label uh, from Winnipeg, Manitoba called War on Music. They re-released um, Here Waits Thy Doom on vinyl. They released Battle Cry Under Winter Sun, our first record, yes. um, on vinyl for the very first time. It had never been on vinyl before, and they were in talks with Roadrunner to do the other two. But uh, Roadrunner's a very frustrating label to work with, I know, firsthand. And not being on the label anymore, they're still, um, it, it's just not high on their priority. They've given the okay, but there's all this like red tape and paperwork they got to deal with. Um, so whoever, you know, just people that, cause I, I let the War on Music guy deal with it. Um, he's basically reached a standstill where he can't get a hold of the people at Roadrunner that he's been trying to deal with. So I've even tried to help him out and say like, you know, drop the guy a line and to no avail. So it's kind of like, it's gotten the green light, but then there's just some still tied up in red, there's some red, red tape, tape yeah. that's, that's being delayed. So this hasn't been going on for a while and it's really frustrating because, uh, war on music, uh, wanted to do, uh, release, all all the records uh like as a package you know oh nice do some kind of collection with it but he was waiting for you know to get the uh get the the go on manufacturing of the two roadrunner records first to really make that happen and then he was going to do it all so um it's uh people are asking about it and yes they will happen eventually it's just uh um a matter of just gotta wait yep (laughs) so as we sit here talking right now where does three inches of blood stand now for any new album new tours or anything we're 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 dying to know yeah right now uh the band's sort of been on a break for uh for the for most of this year um we decided earlier this year that we just needed to uh take a break for a little while we've we've been at it so long going hard that we just kind of needed a breather from the music and just kind of uh you know take a break. <laughs> um, so I don't know. We'll see. We're not really sure. There's no set time is when we're going to yeah. start getting back at it. But, uh, um, we've done the odd show as our, uh, rush tribute band here and there. So that's something that we'll, we'll do every now and then. Um, certainly not hanging up the leathers though, right? No, I wouldn't <laughs> say that at all. Um, yeah, it's, some people feeling burnt out and just uh, don't really feel like writing at the moment. And hey, if, you know. if 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 the heart and passion is in it right now, you know. Yeah, it's just we we want we want to be like we don't want to just shit something out and and say oh here you go. We want to actually like be feeling it, and it's it's something that we just uh, you know, need to recharge our batteries on for the moment. Yeah, because you guys, jeez, you guys were the definition of road road dogs there for for a while. 
Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, okay. Um, let, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, no, that, that's it. <laughs> I was. Uh, <laughs> you're, I was just, you're right. <laughs> it was just saying. Uh, last, you know, a couple more. Th- you know, just one last thing here. Uh, earlier this year, and I'll include the links in the uh, show notes here. Uh, you guys released an amazing documentary, and I've watched a bunch of these. Uh, Three Inches of Blood Warriors in the Great White North. How was that whole experience filming that that followed you you, you guys around? That was really interesting. Uh, we've never really had somebody travel with us for you know any purpose other than working for uh, you know being like a, a road guy, like a sound guy or, or tour manager, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we just. Our, our buddy Tom McLeod, he just one day was like, "Hey, I want to make a documentary about you guys." And we're like, "We're like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, what are you thinking?" And he's like, "Yeah, I want to follow you guys on a tour." And we're like, "All right." So the you know the more we talked about it, the more uh, more it seemed kind of like a kind of a neat idea. And he's just like, "Yeah, I just want to make a documentary on you guys." And it was totally his thing. He did a little bit of crowdfunding for it, um, and say, "Okay, well, why don't you just." come out on this Canadian tour. So he, he flew out East and uh, met up with us in, in Quebec and, and then just drove home with us, uh, from, from East back to West. And it was on a, it was on a really cool tour. It was a really cool time for us, especially, uh, uh, in terms of our hometown hockey team. <laughs> that was during their, uh, Cinderella run through the playoffs, <laughs> which you know ended quite. Uh, uh, I was not going to say uh, anything, but I was not going to say anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 not so, even to this day. Sportscasters here kind of <laughs> refer to it as well, you know, that time. And um, but anyway, yeah, it was uh, it was a uh, it was a really neat time. It was uh, as long as you you uh, didn't take a brick through a window, you know. <laughs> no, I <laughs> I live far from downtown, but I could. Uh, I could see the smoke rising from that. <laughs> it was interesting, but uh, yeah, it was it was pretty rough. But uh, now the tour itself was great. Um, we were on tour with uh, an awesome band, uh, Cancer Bats, and um, one of the funner like Canadian tours we've ever done. Um, so it was it was a good one for Tom to to join us on. Um, we we didn't give him, and it, like I said, it was it was his thing. He wanted to do it, and um he he gave us some uh you know power of you know editing ability over it if there's he he would do a, a, a draft and then we'd watch it and he's like if there's anything you don't like anything you're uh, about the way you're being portrayed then absolutely so um that was really cool so but ultimately it was it was his thing and you know he did it and then but he he wanted us to be involved still at uh, uh on a creative level and uh um, on a on a on a distribution level as well. He didn't want to like go out and try and make a ton, bunch of money out of it. That's why we just kind of got it out there and uh, put it up for like five bucks. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll put the link there for everybody. You know, five bucks. The thing that strikes me about this is the like a hot like a like a traveling uh, junior hockey team. The com- camaraderie, <laughs> com- camaraderie between you and the guys is just. It shines through in, in in that. Yeah, um we're a pretty tight knit bunch of guys. We've uh you know, a lot of bands might not get along or, you know, have fist fights and what we've never been really like that. We've always been pretty level headed. We we have our opinions, but uh um we all face the same hardships while we're out there, but we all persevere and we know how to settle our differences pretty quickly and talk things out. And we know it's, it's all, we're all doing it for the, for the, the same greater good. And that being, you know, our performance and, and our fans and so forth. Well, Cam, I, with that, I'll let you go, brother. I, I truly from, you know, joining me here in the podcast to me personally is my favorite singer today in metal. Uh, thank you for giving me your, your, your time. No problem. Appreciate you having me. And uh, again, guys, follow Cam on Twitter. Follow him uh, at Cam Pipes. Follow him on Instagram. He's he's very re- responsive. I've you know I've tried to talk crap to him about you know USA hockey, and he always puts myself in my place and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Cam, thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. All right. So that was my interview with Cam. Sorry, you know, if I got a little uh, overly nervous and excited there. I'm just a huge fan of him, and I think. 
more metalheads out there uh, should need need to be hearing what three inches of blood are uh, doing. And I'm jealous because I wasn't included. You know, I'm I'm just giving him a hard time here, but uh, you know, it's like seven o'clock eight o'clock on the day that he does the interview and he just shoots me a text and he's like hey i'm gonna be doing an interview with cam pipes in a little while and i'm like what about me motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> what about me it's all about me really <laughs> you know and uh i was like all right man cool do it you know but uh i'm a little bummed i didn't get to sit in on that yeah as you heard uh cam is you know the band's had some up and ups, its ups and downs, um, but he still, you know, loves singing metal. And we talk about, as you heard, you know, Dungeons and Dragons for a little bit. <laughs> uh, a new Dungeons and Dragons came out this year. I will be picking it up and playing it with my brother in a month or so. So it was a fun interview. So glad you guys enjoyed it. If you did, if you didn't like it, shoot me a message. George is at Disciple Ov Metal on Twitter. I'm at Opeth Fan. Shoot us an email, George at We Are Metalheads or Buke at We Are Metalheads dot com. But uh, what are we going into now? Now we've got an indie band that we want to cover. The drummer for this band emailed me a couple of weeks ago, sent me their album. I get stuff like this all the time. Unfortunately, I can't listen to all of it. But in this case, I had a few moments. I popped it on, and what I heard, I liked enough that made me want to hear more. So ultimately, I asked him to send me a copy of the album. I downloaded it. I listened to it, and I think it's actually pretty great. So we're going to play you a couple songs from the album today. The band is called Goat Hanger. They're from Australia, and the album is called The Hook. It's kind of cool. Their logo, like their name, is basically two coat hangers, one on top of the other, in such a way that the coat hangers look like a, like a, the goat head pentagram, sort of. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's kind of funny. And I wasn't sure what I was going to think of something like that. Is it going to be really kind of goofy? Or I mean, because they have a song called like Suck My Balls or something like that. But listening to it, I was pretty impressed. It has a real kind of groove metal, almost Pantera-ish kind of sound to it. And like I told you last night, it's a timeless classic metal sound. Yeah. Very accessible. Yes. So, uh, you know, it was just real easy for me to get hooked on this mm-hmm. album. So... We're going to play a couple songs. We're going to play you one now, and then we'll we'll play you another one at the end of the show. Let's start off with that timeless classic love song called Emma, You Bloated Whore.
All right, that was Goat Hanger from Australia and their song Emma You Bloated Whore from The Hook. Stick around to the end of the show and we will play you another song from Goat Hanger. All righty, let's get into our top three for this week. Again, I posed you the question, what should we do? You came back with, you came back at me with a choice. And no, I, you didn't expect. And I, no, I did not. And of the two that you suggested, I chose Morbid Angel. Mm-hmm. So let's do it. I think this may be the first time where we maybe are in agreement. I don't know. I doubt it. <laughs> my, the curveball is my number three. Like, yeah. No, but now think about it. Maybe I'm my two also. Number three, domination. Okay. For where, where the slime live. I, where the slime live. <laughs> I love that fucking song. And again, if you know, for those of you who've never heard Morbid Angel, just true, just death metal. You know, it's anybody, any other way to dis- describe it. Right, right George? Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's just classic death death metal, right? It is. Uh, number two, this is a tough one because I battled back and forth on this. I looked at it from like a historical impact where they are. Number two, Covenant. Okay, God of Emptiness. The that song is ridiculous. Okay, mm-hmm. but number one, Altars of Madness. The classic, classic. <laughs> See, you're already laughing because I know we're probably not going to be anywhere near each other. Well, like Chapel of Ghouls, Suffocation, Maze of Torment, um, Im- Immortal Rites. Yeah. You know, and uh, interesting fact about them, while well, George, you know, just laughs at me and looks on me. <laughs> you know that all their albums go in alf- alphabetical order? Yes, I knew that. Yeah. Altars of Madness, yep. Blessed of the Sick, Covenant, Domination. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. I wonder if they'll ever get to Z. So what do you got? My number three, <laughs> Domination. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's the only one we line up on. Oh, no. <laughs> My number two is Altars of Madness. Now, I I really had to struggle to figure that out. My my two and my one could easily have flipped, but I was like, you know, I mean, Altars of Madness is is a classic. It's you know genre defining. Did you get it back in eighty nine? I didn't get it then. However, I did see them hmm. on their tour. They played the Michigan Death Fest, the first Michigan, I don't know if there were more of them, but it was the very first Michigan Death Fest, and they headlined, and that had to be in 90. So that was between, you know, Altars came out in 89, Blessed came out in 91. So I'm assuming that that was on the Altars of Madness tour, and it was pretty, like, wow, it was impressive. Uh, I mean, it was just in like a stupid little uh, like hall of some kind, like a firehouse hall or something in in Jackson, Michigan. Uh, but the Morbid Angel setup, you know, the drum kit was just massive, and it was it was something. I saw them twice myself too. Yeah, with Pantera. Okay, my number one, Blessed Are the Sick. Hmm. And I know you're going. How come he didn't include Covenant? Well, yeah, because I thought Covenant was your favorite. No, no, actually, Blessed of the Sick is my favorite. It's been my favorite for a while. I don't know. It's just something about the uh, the production and the mm-hmm. songs. It, just the sound of the album was always my favorite one. You know, Covenant, you, you know, you make a very valid point about Covenant being a good album and it could easily be on that list. And But, you know, those are, those are my three favorite. So that's what I did. Have you stayed with them through the lineup with the... Steve Tucker taking over the vocals and stuff like like that. Nope. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Reason I was going to ask because their 2000 release, Gateways to Annihilation. Yeah. Not bad. Really? I, yeah. I I've I don't know that I've ever listened to it. Domination was pretty much it for me. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't listened to them in years. You know the the whole alphabetical thing it just reminded me. So that that last album they did that began with I. Right. Wow. It did. I'm pretty sure it did. Yeah. And I was wondering Ill- why why they had such a well, yeah, such a strange name, and I was like, "Duh, of course, because it's an I." So, I, I, so the next one would have to be a J. Mm-hmm. What are they going to come up with that sounds evil that starts with a J? Jugular extinction massacre. Now you know David Vincent's back in the group. Yes, okay. and and that was why I was willing to give that last album a listen until I heard it, and I was like, "Oh, oh, sorry, this is excrement." I thought it was metal, and uh, Pete's not on the drums for them anymore. No, God, he could fucking play some skins. Indeed. So that's Morbid Angel. You know, you, you know what you're getting to when you listen to them. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> usually. Old Morbid Depending Angel. Depending on the album. <laughs> yeah. So what have you been listening to this past week? Okay, I listened to this album, and I'm hooked on it. It's going to make my top ten list. It's going to be somewhere in there. That's all I'm going to say. You have been. Uh, you told me about this yesterday, but you wouldn't yep. tell me what it is. And so yep. uh, for the last 24 hours, I've been like racking my brain going, what could it possibly be? The anticipation is okay. killing me. We liked 
Bloodbath release. Yes. We liked it. The classic death metal sound. Yeah. Uh, really good re- return for them. This, <laughs> I'm actually nervous. This is a Pennsylvania, South Carolina band, Horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to that today. And their 2014 release uh, just came out. Uh, ex- Sis, E-C-D-Y-S-I-S. Oh, yeah, I can't say that either. Yeah, I, again, I cannot I cannot e- pronounce it. Ecdysis? Yeah, Ecdysis, maybe. E-C-D-Y-S-I-S, yeah. The killer, killer album art, by the way. Yeah, yeah, the album art's pretty good. <laughs> but <laughs> it's classic death metal. I think it's done exceptionally well. The thing that I liked about this is that the guitar work is horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just I kidding. I know. It's so that was good though. It's really technical. I was getting sounds in uh, there be on my list too. Revocation. I was getting sounds of a lot of pretty skilled technical guitar work from this on some of the guitar parts. Mm-hmm. So this, I was really excited and I have been excited for this album. I've had this for I don't know a month or so. Um, I haven't given it an in depth listen yet. I saw it was coming out on some of the year end lists, so I picked it up to give it a listen. I, and I've listened to a little bit it hasn't hooked me but i haven't you know it was probably like a youtube video or something i need to put on the headphones like i've been telling you i gotta put the headphones on immerse within the music and see what i think because there have been a couple albums in this last couple of weeks that i initially wrote off and was like nah not so much that i put on the headphones got deep into and i'm like oh shit this is gonna make the list so you know i'm not gonna discredit you you know what i just remembered uh, making my list that freaking rigor mortar it more this album came out. Yes, I know. <sighs> that better be on there somewhere. Man, I, I I just forgot about that bad boy making my list the other day. Yeah, there's those two guys from Texas that we know that uh, I was surprised to see that the rigor mortis did not make their list. Yes. I was like, what? Huh. Well, yeah. interesting. A lot of interesting lists out there. Some of them I agree with. Most of them I think are shit. And again, the thing, that, the nice thing I like about this list is it's us. Our tastes are really going to shine. I'm on, it's going to be clear on my end of the year list. No black metal is going to be on it. As much as I like to bash, like I was just bashing and saying there's a bunch of shit lists out there. As much as I like to do that, that's, that's, that's done in fun. Yeah, it is. It's you always know? done in fun. Because you always got to keep in mind that these lists are subjective to the people that are listening to them. I like what I like. You like what you like. And there's no telling the other person that they're right or they're wrong because that's what it is. You know, you like what you like. So would you ever, not to get away from you doing your, what you're listening to, would you ever get away or sorry, would you ever like, I know there is a Grammy for heavy metal, but it means nothing. They don't even put it on the show anymore. It's not even worth the paper that the nominations read off of. Mm Mm-hmm. Would you ever want to see like a real industry award like that that has some weight to it? You mean like the Golden Be- Gods? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good because you know how when you it's never our music, but when you win the Grammy for Album of the Year, mm-hmm. I know some of them are one hit wonders and stuff. Sure, but in that music world, it it carries a lot. Yeah, but would I it mean anything to you if Metal had that? Where like, hey, the panel is like your Brian Slagle. It's it's your if if it were people like Brian Slagle that were yes. picking the releases, yes. it would it might have some meaning to me. But I mean, it's just like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame being a joke, you know. It's like, oh, you you included you know somebody that's not even rock, you know, in it. Okay, fine. It's like I'm not going to say the band that I w- we were talking about before the show started. Somebody that made a number one on a list that I said that's not metal. You know, it's fine that that person likes that band enough to put it as number one on their list. I'm not going to berate them for it. Personally, I don't consider it metal. It's like when Jethro Tull beat out Metallica at the Grammys. Like, and everybody's like, but Jethro Tull's not metal. Yeah, well, same case here. This band that took this number yeah, one spot, honest, yeah. I don't consider them metal. I consider it pop music with a double bass and a distorted guitar. It's otherwise, you could, like I said, you could drop out the drums, drop out the guitars, remix it with a drum machine and a keyboard, and the vocals would work just fine as a pop song. So, and. Uh, and you know, this applies to like video games, buddy. You look at when they do end of the year video game reviews, mm-hmm. uh, lists, I'm sorry, you might not be a first person shooter. I may be a first person shooter fan. Right. Hey, yeah. So, know, where's the common ground that we find? Exactly. I don't like black metal. You like black metal. It's, you know, the greatest black metal album this year could ever, could have ever been released to me. I, you know. Well, this week's convincing Buke, I am going to 
work you with some black metal. Okay. So what were you listening to? But what and what actually what I was listening to, I have two of them. I'll start with the first one. The first one is something that you might like. It's called it's a band from New Zealand called The House of Capricorn. Mm. And their album Morning Star Rise. And this is one that I just finally heard this past week. It's gonna be on the list somewhere. My list is gonna have to be more than fifty. It's just gonna have to be. It's kind of doom, but it's like quicker. You know, it's okay. not slow like Doom. It's kind of mid-paced to even fast at times with clean vocals. You know, maybe a little stoner, but eh, what? It's it's heavy metal with relatively clean vocals, and I dig it a lot. So that's the first thing I was listening to this week. The second thing I was listening to this week is also going to be the Convincing Buke. Okay, and they're a black metal band from I want to say Colorado, Denver, perhaps. I forgot to look it up. They're on Prosthetic Records. It's a very much contemporary sounding black metal. And the band is called Wayfarer. And the album is Children of the Iron Age. Unfortunately, I could only find two songs from the album on YouTube. So for those of you following along on Facebook, there's only going to be two songs. I have provided Buke with the entire album. So he can listen to... Yeah, I will. He can listen to these two songs and more to make his evaluation. Now, Wayfarer... They have sort of a classic black metal style in terms of music, but the music is really good. The vocals are harsh, but it's got a pretty clean, modern sounding production. The execution and arrangement is a bit more contemporary. And so I feel that you might be able to get into this because the, the songs are kind of long and the music itself is just badass. And I'm, that's what I'm hanging my hat on here is that you're going to listen to this and think the music is really cool and the vocals, well, True classic black metal vocals? Um, they're harsh. I mean, it's not... I don't think it's quite as screechy. Because that's the turnoff to me. It's always been with black metal. Just you know, to give some history for the convincing buke, mm -hmm. is that like putting on mayhem and stuff like that. It's that screechy... <laughs> You know, yeah, I don't really, I don't think of it as, as as quite that screechy. It's it's a little more. You might even consider it more death. Hmm. But the two songs that I've got that I'm going to be putting up on Facebook are the title track "Children of the Iron Age" and another song called "A Place Among Stars." So your mission <laughs> is to listen to "Children of the Iron Age" by Wayfarer, and next time we will find out can Buke like a black metal album. Because I will admit, because the only black metal up to this point is a symphonic black metal trend that was happening in the 2000s, like Immortal, not Immortal, like Dimmu mm -hmm. was doing for a while. So, yep. I'm hoping that this might be the gateway drug that we can back you into gently into some black metal, get you started out. Do you think you can never start anybody with black metal? You got to start somewhere. I mean, you know. I started somewhere. Everybody started somewhere. So we'll see. Hmm. We will see. I'm only about 50-50. I, re I really think this could go either way. I think you'll, you might dig the music. But on the other hand, sometimes you just don't hear what I hear. So we'll see. All right. What's your classic for this week? You talked about them earlier in uh, the Lyric video. This is, as I wait for Wikipedia to pop up, this is a 1992 release from Blind Guardian. They're somewhere far beyond. Right on. This is when uh, you know, Tales from a Twilight World came out in 1990. This is when um, Blind Guardian's really starting to get the gears turning on the power metal sound that they would you know, really hit their peak, I think, in for Imaginations from the Other Side, which would follow three years later. But this album has the classic, you know, crowd live performance loving the Bard song. Mm -hmm. on yeah. It. Um, this, it's, it's their, their fourth album. Um, again, if you want to, you know, see classic power metal and what power metal has really evolved into now from when it left the eighties and started, you know, to really go into the nineties and stuff. This is, this is a great album. This is before I think what George was talking about earlier, Blind Garden started to kind of get old. Like you had heard it yeah. many times before. It's not my favorite Blind Guardian, but uh, I do love the Bard song. So I excellent. I wanted to go with that. Well, I sort of uh, neglected to. Uh, it's okay. You're busy. Spend some time. Yeah, it's been an incredibly busy week, and I forgot to come up with a classic. So as we've been going through the podcast today, I've been sort of frantically looking for something that sort of fits the classic category that I could talk about today. And I just came up with something, another album that just turned 30 years old a couple months ago. Not the biggest album from this band, but this was sort of a an album that re-jump-started their career in the 80s. This is Perfect Strangers by Deep Purple. 
Hmm. I love that album. Wow. That was actually, you know, 84. That's like right around when I started getting into metal. Mm -hmm. Perfect Stranger is not like a huge metal album, you know. I mean, it's it's more of a hard rock album these days. But it brought back Ian Gillen, Richie Blackmore, you know, the whole Mark II lineup, I'm pretty sure. I'd have to double check that. But it was it was their 80s comeback album and, you know, had songs like uh, Knocking on Your Back Door. Oh, man, I love that song. Under the gun, nobody's home. Do you know how many times I see this album in the record store and I pass it? Uh, oh man, it's funny because when the album came out, the title track "Perfect Strangers" didn't really. That was like one of the songs that I would skip over, and God knows why. I guess I just my I, my taste hadn't evolved enough to understand it yet. But now, "Perfect Strangers" the song is like my favorite song off that album. It's just it's badass, you know. Richie Blackmore, John Lord, you know, fucking a. Yeah. Roger Glover. Yeah, Ian Pace. The, it, it, is this, it is the classic Mach 2 lineup, so it was just a great album. And then the, the one that came after that, too, House of Blue Light, another good, great, you know, middle-era album. You think kids today listen to Deep Purple and realize no. how amazing they are? No, you know, I, I bet you that, you know, if they even know the band, they're like, oh, yeah, Smoke on Smoke the Water. On the water. Yep. <laughs> or... uh what are the other ones they play on the radio? Uh, Space Truckin' mm-hmm. and uh, one of my personal favorites, uh, Woman from Tokyo. That's a big one. Yeah, you know, if you're looking to get into the purple Perfect Strangers, this isn't a bad place to start. That's where I started. Look where I am now. <laughs> like Joe Elliott from Def Leppard said, in 1971, there were only three bands that mattered, Zeppelin, Sabbath, and Deep Purple. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, Purple was not as big over here as it was in Europe and and still, you, even still. Yeah, in Europe, Deep Purple was massive. So, check it out. Was it last year when they lost their keyboardist? Or was it this year? Uh, no, it was... Was it last year? Or was it even the year before? Because, God, you look at the impact. I remember, like, Lars and guys were coming out, you know, saying how much he meant to... Uh, oh, John Lord was huge. And, uh, yeah, he died in 2012. So. Wow! Wow! Yeah, huge loss. I cried. I cried when John Lord died. What What a, what a great, great pull. That was... That was Man, I really need. I passed on that album. Yeah, no, definitely, you should get that. All right, well, we're just about ready to wrap up the episode. We're I had gonna fun pl- today. We're gonna, yeah, it was, uh, definitely went a lot longer than I thought it was going to, given the lack of news and releases. But uh, we're getting ready to play you another song from Goat Hanger. But before we do, before we do, I just again just wanted to thank Cam for the time he gave me for the interview. Uh, again, to check out the documentary from them. If you need a place to start with Three Inches of Blood, I would highly, highly recommend Advance and Vanquish. I have not been out of excited for an album in 20 years or so i've been listening to metal and uh their most recent album long live heavy metal came out last year i believe maybe two years yeah, ago. two years ago now yes two years ago now i apologize cam um uh, but long live heavy metal their most recent album you can see where the bands evolved to and they're still rocking so thanks cam yep and of course like he said make sure to check us out facebook check us out on twitter i'm disciple ov metal at opeth fan and of course metalheads pod check us out on stitcher on youtube and of course at we are metalheads.com all right let's wrap this episode up with another song from goat hanger the australian band from their album the hook this is pre-mortem autopsy see you next time mm-hmm. 